Hello my fellow pilots and welcome again to another episode of Star Citizen FM, episode 12. My name is Dr. Hawk and I will be your host for today. This week is going to be kind of short so I apologize in advance if this isn't your usual meaty thigh bone of awesome news. I'll start off with the review of my usual, Review of Wingman's Hangar. I'll be going into a few little announcements I have to make as well as clan spotlights, uh, a fan mention, and then a important topic that actually needs to be br brought up, rather. as well as I actually don't have any interview for this current show, so I apologize, as as far as I know, the CIG team is quite busy, and I am working fervently to ensure that there are more in meaty interviews in the future. So without further ado, let's move on to Wingman's Hangar, episode 13. Uh, this week review had a few interesting things. Anybody checking the com link would notice that we had logos shown. These logos were related to all the different branches of the UEE. This would be anything from the uh, the Navy to the military, the military of course, the Army, the Navy, uh, the Marines even, so anybody that's interested in actually checking out the logos as well as the design process and maybe even a little bit of lore uh, pertaining to these different branches can do so on the com link and there will also be a link in the description below. Um, there is also a fan related question that I'll be covering later that ties into these logos, so keep tuned for that. The other thing, uh, fairly big news for myself, since he is a personal hero for me. To anyone that has ever played a MechWarrior game and played the popular CryEngine mod MechWarrior Living Legends, uh, the CIG team hired on Dan Tracy. He was the lead for this mod and has worked for Crytek and has an extensive knowledge of the CryEngine and this will undoubtedly help them further their development of Star Citizen. I'll be covering uh, his introduction much later, but for now, Dan Tracy, yay, hero, is now part of the CIG team. As well, we also got a little bit of nose cam footage from Eric. We actually got to, uh, well, a quick side note to anyone that remembers the previous uh, Wingman's nose cam. You'll notice that the office it's getting a little bit tight. I don't know if you, any of you have paid attention to Senate, who does Star's Oratoria, but when I cover that later, he is mentioned even by Wingman himself. Things are getting tight, and as far as I know, they might have to consider moving out soon. There was something about a mention of a one-year lease. Um, the last thing that was really shown in the week of review was some of the skeleton rigging and for the player character so anyone interested in seeing how that design process is working out can check that out there should be a video of it playing right now anybody that remembers uh, the model that I showed previously in the show and that was also shown on Wingman's Hangar will notice that her body, and this is going to sound horrible, her body is getting used very well for the production of the character I don't really know how to word that any better, but her assets are helping greatly. I'm just digging a hole for myself here. Regardless, let us move on to more news. This week's Fan Spotlight, which, remember, is a new segment that was introduced last episode on Wingman's Hangar, was focused on Michael Nightingale. He is actually one of the more generous sponsors for the CIG team, and is apparently also the creator of the lamp. Lamp enthusiasts, you might want to bow down and praise Michael Nightingale. Uh, some of you familiar with Dark Souls are familiar with Praise the Sun. We might have to come up with a saying for Praise the Lamp or Praise Michael. Just saying. He, he might like that. He's also responsible for most of the diabetes infusing treats and booze that you see get sent to the CIG team. Not not so much the treats, but more responsible for some of the finer liquors and spirits. It turns out that Michael is actually quite the beer enthusiast and spirit connoisseur. 
If you check out the interview, they have a great discussion regarding some fine liquors. I know even myself, I enjoy the occasional drink. And some of you are even lucky to experience Drunk Hawk. Although, right now I have to be fairly sober to do a proper show, so I apologize that you have no showing of Drunk Hawk. Michael Nightingale, so far as I can tell, has money, has ships, and will travel. I look forward to seeing him in space, and look forward to seeing the many ships that he is flying. If you're interested in checking out the full interview, you can check out Wingman's Hangar and watch the full interview. Some of our forum feedback had some interesting selection of questions this time. Uh, some of them ranging from sexual intercourse with pirate booty to missiles that tend to explode in your face. Our first question e comes from Zacket, asking, Where will a player's ship be when they are offline? Does it remain in their hangar, or just floating in space? Uh, according to Eric, your ship stays where you logged out. If it's in the hangar, it's safe. Otherwise, you're pretty shit out of luck. Anybody that's ever played EVE Online might actually be familiar with this mechanic. I know it's not a game that likes to be mentioned, but given the fact it shares a lot with Star Citizen, or at least concepts, it's going to be talked about. In EVE Online, if you were to log out in space, your ship literally stays where you logged out. Sometimes it'll warp off in a random direction to try to save your assets, but if you pretty much disconnect or anything, you're just left floating in space. So this would not be a good game to rage quit, log out, or maybe have a power interruption because I might come and take your stuff. Sorry, but I will. Reebok was the next, uh, next to ask. He's uh, wondering where the current focus of the game is, or rather how much time is spent on the game, planning, etc. Um, Eric didn't exactly elaborate on this. All we have is that the wheels are spinning, and the programmers are programming, the artists are artisting. Not much to really go on, and given the fact that it's still early in development, it's fair to expect less. However, we do know that they do try to get together to fix any blockages, make sure flow of information is optimum, etc. Odd God was the next to ask if will we will be able to purchase afterburners that affect thrusters and not just the main engines. Key words here. Eric did say that we will be able to buy afterburners, however they are being balanced in terms of usability. He did not mention thrusters. I don't know if this was deliberate, or it maybe it was an oversight, but there was no specific mention, Odd God, to your actual question of afterburner thrusters. So we might have to either look forward to future information, or maybe assume that we won't have afterburner thrusters. However, maybe we'll be able to interchange thrusters. Don't know. Heartsblade was the next to ask the question relating to those branches of UEE that were shown in the logos. He asked, with the unveiling of the different branches of the UEE, will there be add-ons to the Squadron 42 campaign or the, even the other branches? Again, not much clarification for this question. Squadron 42 will not be the only epic journey you partake in. This is, again, another veiled, very secret hint. It gives us some expectation that maybe, you know, you might go explore with the Marines or go do some crazy Navy action. Who knows? DM Gavin was the next to ask if will there be an in game dating service for us middle aged gamers? Some of us want some serious pirate booty. Ah oh, Lord. Hooking up is not encouraged. Blowing up is. That's all Eric said. You guys really are priceless. You know that, right? There's the answer to that question. S. Mull, and I apologize, my friend, if I am saying this wrong, asked if we are going to be able to hire NPC crew members. Uh, when we hire them, is it for only one trip? Are they permanent add-ons that require a salary? And is it possible for them to die or even get injured? Eric clarified that we'll actually be using contracts for this type of interactivity. 
This will be enforced by an in-game government, so for example, breaking a contract could cause a bounty or even repercussions for breaking said contract. Also mentioned that if they get killed or injured, they get killed or injured. Tough shit. This is more relating to the permadeath mechanic, so just like some other games that require micromanagement of NPCs and fake people, you too will have to require micromanagement and maintenance of your fake people with fake hearts and fake families. Maybe. I don't know. Crisis was the next to ask. When I crashed my car, I learned a valuable lesson. Insurance companies are the cult of Satan. Will they be like this in Star Citizen as well? Very good question, by the way, because I too agree that insurance companies are the cult of Satan. And you can rest assured that apparently evil is as evil does. We'll have cults of Satan in Star Citizen too. Damn it. Logante was the next to ask, and also maybe next time you're asking a question, don't do it while working on a explosive weapon. How are we going to be able to communicate with other players? Will this be VIOP? Will we have avatars and can we broadcast via hailing? Or is the game going to approach a more generic general chat instant messaging system? And I'm also not sure if he survived at the end of the question. Regardless, Logante, great videos, but seriously, man, you know, work safe environment. I uh, might want to check into a union, maybe. According to Eric, the comm system will be like Wing Commander and Privateer. Being that I've mentioned before that I haven't had a chance to play much Wing Commander Privateer, I cannot provide a decent answer as to what this will be like, but to anyone who has, that is pretty much the answer for you. Despite the fact that most people will, or at least try to use Skype or other third-party programs, I'm actually hoping that people try to use the in-game systems as the immersion will be quite fun to use. Kin Shadow actually came on and asked what the Pocket Destroyer was in the Cutlass description. Uh, Eric went to elaborate that the Pocket Destroyer is just a smaller version of a destroyer, just like another classification for any kind of ship, frigate, destroyer, whatever. He's also hunting Legante, so good luck with that. I, I, we could use a good showdown video, so if you guys are going to fight, at least record it for us, so I can broadcast it later. Dr. Hawk came... okay, you know, I'm not even going to bother. Dr. Hawk, myself, I had a question regarding what kind of sneaky actions we will be able to perform in the game. Being an EVE player myself, I desperately desperately want some sort of stealth or covert ops equipment. The answer was more that sneaking around and sneaky stuff will be possible as to how this will be done. Again, this is a wait and see approach, but who knows, maybe I can do just hide behind an asteroid or something. Another mention by the video that I used, that is footage of MechWarrior Living Legends for anyone interested in trying it. I will be posting a link later for the game. You do need Crisis Wars, I believe, still to play it, but it's only like five bucks now. So if you'd like to actually try what some of Dan Tracy's work is, I highly suggest go trying MechWarrior Living Legends. They did a great job. And hell, it's not even Crisis anymore, it's its own game. The only thing that's left over is the engine. So, again, props to Dan Tracy. That was pretty much the whole of the fan questions, so now let us move on to the Wide World News. In this week's Spotlight, Dr. Cameron Smith is designing his own spacesuit. This will be planned for a 50,000 foot balloon flight to the edge of space. Declined by the space program for his own eyesight, this looks like it will be his way of reaching his dream among the stars. Also in this week in space, on March 16, 1966, Neil Armstrong and Dave Scott, part of the Gemini program, performed the world's first docking maneuver. However, an issue came up when they found themselves inexplicably spinning. As it turns out, one of the thrusters was stuck in the on position, and after a cycling of the thrusters, they were able to disengage and abort the mission and return safely. It's this kind of attitude that gave Neil Armstrong and Dave Scott the positions they have. 
And that, ladies and gentlemen, was our worldwide news. In the next segment of the show, we get to see Dan Tracy's interview. Again, mentioned before, Dan Tracy was the lead on MechWarrior Living Legends and is being hired on as the senior technical designer. He has worked previously with Crytek and actually got hired through the above mod work, uh, having to train himself in both modeling, programming, and game design, level design, pretty much being a jack of all trades. I believe that's what actually got him hired onto Crytek. Another interesting note is he's actually from my hometown, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. So the fact that a fellow Edmontonian found work with Crytek gives me hope that one day I will be doing the same and not have to live in the city of potholes and snow. Dan Tracy got connected to Chris through the Rise game and is fairly familiar with Chris's games, mostly through Freelancer, not so much Wing Commander and is pretty much all around an awesome guy and also reinforced uh, some of the stereotypes that are associated with Canadians which I frankly don't mind, eh? If you would like to check out the full interview I suggest checking out Wingman's Hangar which should be in the description below and as mentioned before if you guys would like me to start doing full interviews I have no problem doing so especially in the slow news segments that I'm having such as now one of the other interviews that I would like to bring up, um, this is actually sidetracking as Wingman's Hangar ended with Dan Tracy's interview, um, Senate, one of our community members, if you're familiar with him, you should be, hosts the Stars Oratoria podcast. In his episode, he was actually able to grab Eric Peterson, Wingman himself, for a good hour-long interview between topics of industry, game development, and interest in the game itself. There was a wide variety of topics discussed, and if some of you actually want to find out who Eric Peterson really is, I suggest you go check it. Senate has been doing a great job. He has eight episodes so far, and I'm looking forward to more. So if you'd like to go check out Stars Oratoria, I highly suggest you go do that. So, no doubt by now some of you have noticed that this episode probably sounds both slightly rushed and lacking in content. Aside from some of the concept art that we had come out for Terra uh, and Moscow, as well as the new emblems, there's not much I can really go on. And rather than droning on and on about news and trying to extend the show, I'm actually just going to bring up a few announcements that need to be made, and if you guys are interested, you can reply in the comments below on YouTube, in the forums, or message me at lucas.g.drhawk at gmail.com or starcitizenfm at gmail.com. One of those things, actually, in relation to the emails, clans, I am a little disappointed. Previously, I had mentioned I would be happy to do clan spotlights for you guys. I've only gotten two messages from the last two clans I spotlighted, yet before I had a pile of messages. I don't mind doing spotlights for you guys, but as I said, I would like a nice sort of condensed form of what you'd like me to say and I can spotlight for you guys. I can't do it if I have no messages and nobody's talking to me. So if you would like your clan spotlighted, as I mentioned, message me on the forums, the YouTube video or the above mentioned emails. However, getting back to the topic I wanted to discuss, if you look at the above comment that I should have posted right now, I think some of us are starting to forget an important thing. Star Citizen is an ambitious game. It's big, it's huge, and it's probably going to go down in the history books as the greatest thing since sliced bread, cheese, and gravy. Sadly, this also means where reality kicks in. Star Citizen is two years away, yet the above comment shows, sadly, some of the impatience that is starting to show. The reality is, is that games take time to make, and some of us need to remember that there's not really not much to cover in such a short time frame when they need a lot of time to actually make anything. So, to compensate for such a thing, I have actually come up with the idea of, well, a few things. 
One of them is community hosted events. As I mentioned before in some of my videos, when the game does come out, I want to be covering, you know, the happenings in the universe, starships, etc. But until then, I can't. I was starting to think, what if the community started hosting games that are similar? Star Conflict, maybe old replays of Wing Commander or Privateer, or just having some sort of community get-togethers where we can get together, have fun, and mess around a little. This also brings up another topic that I've been thinking of, and something that has been pitched to me by several people I know. What would you guys think of Dr. Hawk doing some Let's Plays? And before you go nuts with this, I don't mean just any generic Let's Play like Let's Grab Call of Duty. What does that have to do with Star Citizen? Star Citizen FM will always be related to Star Citizen, and I'd like to be doing Let's Plays that are related to such. I've mentioned before that I've never played Wing Commander. I Well, it's a lie. I have, but I was a, so young at the time I didn't even really get past the menu screen and our computer sadly melted into a pile of dead circuits and plastic. So if you guys would be interested in some Let's Plays, something that, you know, can distract us while we wait for some more meaty news from the CIG team, I would be happy to do so. And even if we did detract and to, you know, maybe trying to get me to play a scary game because I've had one person I know who seems to think that it's impossible to scare me and I tend to agree. If you guys would be interested in other side projects of Star Citizen FM, let me know in the comments below or in the forums. This isn't a relation to what I mentioned previously of what Star Citizen needs so much as just what should we do while we wait for the more meaty stuff? Because again, like the above comment shows, there is not always going to be news. And I would like to make sure that in the time that there isn't news, I have at least something entertaining and fun for you guys. In the meantime, I am again looking at possible interviews with more dev team members. I have had help with s from several of you from Chatroll who have helped me get in touch with Sandy, as well as I believe I talked to, okay, and this is going to really suck, Dave Safwad. Please correct me later. As well as I'm going to be trying to contact some of the other dev team members, my ultimate goal is to try to interview each and every one of you, one of you and I'm talking to you, CIG, and hopefully talk to you even down the road after I've talked to you for possible updates, and maybe even after the game releases, we can talk about what you've liked, what could have been improved, etc. So I gave you guys something to think about, as well as the possibility of what my future plans are with the show, and hopefully... Our patience is resolute, we can stand together and be patient. Remember, that's the important thing in this part, is that we need to be patient and let CIG develop the game that will go down in history as the Jesus of all video games. This is Dr. Hawk wishing you all safe flight and safe travels. You guys take care and have a great weekend.